Smith back to our basketball show, back again with another episode, one that people thought said wouldn't happen because of uh, so much Twitter beef between me and the person that you're about to hear from. Uh, Backchat underscore basketball on Instagram is where you can get in touch with us or hello at Backchat uh podcast.com.au you can email us there as well whatever you want to email us we'll probably read it out um let's get straight into it shane heel um is our guest today uh shane thanks for coming on and chatting to me uh, people you know they've highlighted you and i going back and forth on twitter a little bit and um they thought hey they're probably not gonna they're not on speaking terms but no obviously i'm being a bit facetious thanks for coming on well, you're not the Lone Ranger, so uh, <laughs> yeah, nothing special about that. But uh, no, all good. Good to be on, and always nice to be able to have some, uh, you know, different thoughts on Twitter. That's for sure. That's right. I do appreciate that about you that you do that you're happy to go back and and have a chat with people. It's not just a a one way street. So no, that's good. Um, let's let's get into a few things NBA or NBA. But firstly, before we do that, every sort of back chat guest that we have on on the other show that that I'm a part of. Um, we ask for their greatest sporting achievement. So obviously you've done a lot of good things in the um, basketball world. You've represented your country, you're a champion, you've you've coached, you've done just about everything. But I'm going to put some rules on this. You can't talk about basketball. So any anything that you've done outside of the basketball court, I want to hear about. So your greatest sporting um, thing that you could ha- your, hang your hat on um, off the basketball court. Uh, I mean, probably being a dad. You know, for me, having three beautiful daughters, I'm very, very fortunate to um, to have and all great kids and all really close to, to all of them, a big part of their lives. So, um, you know, I think anyone that becomes a dad, it's a special time and you sort of can't compare that to anything else you do in your life, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. My, I've got two kids as well. I'd, I'd still say for me, it's um, bowling five for sixteen in the under twelves cricket grand final. But um, okay, <laughs> no, I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. Sure I'll appreciate that as you get older. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, they'll they'll learn how good that is. Don't worry. Um, yeah. Let's get down. Actually, firstly, are you a Geelong fan? Is that right? I am. Yeah. So yep, how how, I was born. how are you feeling at the moment? Uh, nervous. 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 Um, <laughs> Yeah, it hasn't been a great start for the Cats, has it? And, no. Uh, you know, that first half against Hawthorne, I was sitting there just saying, oh, my goodness, this is going to be a bad year. And then we turned it on. But still some worrying signs, I would think. But I yeah. um, had a pretty good run. You know, yeah. I had no choice growing up. My dad said, you either barrack for Geelong or you, you get out. And uh, <laughs> so it's family tradition. And, um, yeah. yeah, had some good times. Are you a, are you a Geelong boy? No, I'm not. No, I grew up in Victoria, but my grandparents grew up in Geelong, so that's where the history comes from. And yep. played three years for the Supercats, so that was yep. nice to be down there amongst it all. When uh, got to know the players and did a lot of promos, and we'd go to each other's games and all the rest of it. So good yeah. memories. I am. Um, I'm an Eagles fan, so I was secretly hoping that, that that Geelong would demolish the Hawks because I didn't want the Eagles to be the first people to like really just cop it from Geelong. So. I'm hoping that they got that sort of out of their system and that the West Coast can sort of uh, at least be sort of competitive with them, which, look, to be honest, it's probably not going to happen. But, you know. I love the fact you're optimistic, <laughs> looking for something. Yeah. <laughs> the thing I've got is that it's in Adelaide. So it's not it's not Cardinia Park. It's not down Geelong where we just have absolutely no hope. Adelaide is at least some sort of neutral ground. Um all right, NBA. So currently, the the play in tournament is happening. Firstly, what's your thoughts on on a play in tournament for um, playoff seeding? I like it. You know, I, I think we've already seen it work for the fact that teams just stop tanking a bit earlier, or well, some of them anyway. And uh, you know, you look at OKC, but they just hung in there, hung in there, hung in there, trying to make it. And I love their philosophy that they just wanted to win as much as they possibly could for this young team. So. You know, I think it's a good thing, and I, I thought we saw it work in the NBL as well to keep teams alive, like the Perth Wildcats, <laughs> who were just desperate to try and hang on to some sort of, um, you know, playoff hopes. And you know, I think it's a good theory. Yeah, we'll get to the Wildcats and figure out like if you absolutely despise them or you hate Perth or what your situation with with your, or your relationship with Perth is. Um, with with the NBA, so I'm a Mavs fan, um, and that's been really difficult uh, the last. You know, decade but um you know 2011 they won the championship and i'm still holding on to that as much as i can because everything after that's been pretty brutal um what's your take on the luka Doncic and Kyrie irving situation there 
well, I just thought it was a bad trade to start with. You know, just it was never going to work. Um, you know, I thought Dallas were a little bit smarter than that um, and had a little bit more foresight about what they were going to try and do. And, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's been a disaster, really. And, uh, you know, I, got, I, I think they got what they probably deserved by making that trade. <laughs> Yeah, it's been hard. I, I keep like I, I'm, I'm an optimist mostly with the the teams that I go for, and I still keep thinking like it's going to turn around, it's going to turn around, and then you know before you know it, the Mavs are just openly tanking, and now the NBA are in, investigating <laughs> investigating their movements towards the end of the season. So uh, look, they had to keep that that number ten pick that they're holding on to, otherwise it goes to the Knicks. So I, I get the tanking, but. To have Luca and Kyrie and you're tanking at the end of the year is just such a weird concept and uh, brutal brutal to watch. Who, who's Do you have an NBA team that you sort of have a soft spot for that you follow? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I, I love Joey Ingles and, you know, seeing him at Milwaukee now I think is a great thing and, you know, they're the team that I think will, will win it and I think he can play a critical role, not just on the court but in the locker room as well with his personality and, the way he is as a bloke. So um, they're the team that I love seeing win and, and got my fingers crossed for the season. Yeah. There's been a couple of fights lately um, in, in, in the NBA, and this is like in in team fights. So we had the the one with um, uh, Bones Highland the, at the, the Clippers, which shouts to him, VCU um, – uh, grad VCU guy. I went to VCU for a semester, so uh, Bones is like that that one sort of guy out of VCU that I can root for. Um, and then there was also the the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves uh, fight recently. Well, it wasn't really a fight; it was a swing. Did you? Um, how do you feel about that thing? Are you? Do you think that's like good? I mean, it's not good for a team, but when there's a bit of passion involved, like there's there must be like something good about it. Jeez, you are an optimist, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to take good out of that Minnesota situation, no, I mean, bad. talk about it, another bad trade. You know, with what the Timberwolves gave up for Gobert was just absolutely unbelievable. And, and you can see the, the frustration from the other players. I mean, yep. reportedly, they're saying, go get a block, go get a rebound, go do something for us, please. Yep. And um, there is a frustration. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes... You know, there's a lot of egos involved. Well, not sometimes. There's always egos involved in the NBA. Um, and they're probably fed up with it. And they want more from him. And they're trying to challenge him. And then there's the reaction from the other side where there's some frustration as well. So it's just not a great mix in Minnesota right now, mm. even though they were able to get it done this morning, I think. Yeah, I know, right? It's um, And Gobert obviously didn't play. He was suspended. So maybe that was, um, you know, something that brought the team together without him being there. Because I think he's sort of pissed off a few of them. So it's probably, you know, maybe that's helped the Timberwolves, him not being there. Um, you must have been involved in a, some, you know, some scuffles in, in team practices and things like that. Um, yeah, early days. I remember it's along um, with a teammate uh, got into a scuffle and actually got into – an actual fight at half time <laughs> behind closed doors. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, after that, I mean, there's always, you know, there's some disagreements and different things, but uh, never to the stage where you're going to swing on a teammate in a timeout in a game on the court. I mean, that's, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I know. That's like next level boiling over. Behind closed doors when, you you know, maybe tensions are getting a bit, in, um, you know, really full on. But when you're doing it in front of, you know, 13,000 fans and on national TV, it must be like uh, really bad at that point. Um, who's your pick for the championship at the moment? Are you, are you going? Yeah, I'm going for Milwaukee, yeah. Yep. I, I went for them, you know, over the last couple of years. And, you know, I thought they were a legitimate chance before – Middleton got hurt in the playoffs last year, wasn't it? So, yeah, yeah. Um, I just love their balance. You know, I think when you've got a superstar like the Greek Freak that's so passionate um, and just plays every position like he does and, you know, a guy that is so good but then goes away in the off season and just tries to go to another level, I just think it spreads throughout the team. And, you know, I think Middleton's a really good second man. Halliday's great as well. They've got some really good pieces in yep. there and uh, I think they've got enough offense and defense to be able to get it done. Brooke Lopez somehow is like defied age and just become possibly the best big man in the league. He had nine block shots not that long ago. He's hitting threes. He's he's like a man on a mission. I haven't seen him this good for, I mean, maybe ever. Like he, he might be in like career best form. 
it's yeah, well, he, he had to change his game, didn't he? So he's yeah. been able to evolve with the time. And then I think it helps for somebody like him, you know, if he was playing for Detroit, would mm. he be playing the same sort of way? Probably not. But I think when you're around great players and a good system and you can play your role and you find out what that niche is, how you can contribute to, to winning, then it becomes more enjoyable as well. And I think he's just found that perfect spot. Yeah. Let's go uh, to Australia in the NBL. So obviously Sydney Kings, uh, back-to-back champions, um, reasonably reasonably good grand final series with um, the Breakers. I was worried it was going to be a bit of a um, – just a whitewash with them and and it'd be a, a king sweep. But the, the breakers were really good, a really good matchup for the Kings. Um, what's your thoughts generally on the season gone? Um, you know, I think Sydney were obviously the best team, but apart from that, what did, what did you say? You obviously had no respect for New Zealand, right? No. They were up by seven with five minutes to go in the game to win the whole series. <laughs> I you were worried about a sweep. I thought pre, I thought pre, yeah, I was, I was worried about a, a sweep, um, but you know they obviously they 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 were matched up well against the Kings, but no, I, I was going, I was actively going for the Breakers because of all the cliches of the lead up to <clears throat> um, this season and what they had to go through last season, and, and I also just don't really love the Sydney Kings generally, so I was going for the Breakers, but yeah, I didn't respect them enough, obviously. Yeah. Um- no, I always thought it was going to be a good series. I actually tipped New Zealand in the series just because I thought they had the athleticism in the front court to be able to compete with the Kings. And I thought the Kings probably would have struggled had Keanu Pinder actually played for Cairns. I think that series would have been completely yeah. different if Cairns had a full team. So, you know, the season was incredible. And, I mean, you only have to look at the stats of, you know, the people that watched on TV and the bums on seats and, uh, the evenness of the competition I thought was fantastic this year. And, you know, Larry and Jeremy continue to do a great job of really taking this product to the, to the next level. And, you know, when you add a new franchise, you know, like Tazzy coming in and, and making the playoffs two years in a row was a great decision. And, um, you know, they're planning on more teams coming in and hopefully they can have the same success uh, moving forward with these expansion teams. Yeah, what what do you like? Give us your take on Perth. So obviously, like, because I'm a Perth guy and I loved the Wildcats as a kid, and as I, I also worked for them, so I think now I'm less of a fan, and I just sort of you know observe what they do. But it seems like Perth people, and I'm happy to put myself in this, that have this like this feeling that the rest of the country hates us um, for whatever reason. For someone who doesn't live in Perth or is from not not from Perth, how do you see the Perth Wildcats? What do you what do you think of them? Well, it's not the Wildcats; it's more the fans. I think there's this insecurity, <laughs> like yeah. you just said. That you think, you know, I remember commentating a game in in Perth, and I commentated for twenty years or so. And when we used to fly around, I remember having a beer with a mate across the road in the pub, and this little guy comes up and he goes, "Why do you hate the Wildcats so much?" <laughs> and I said, do you? do you really think I care who won tonight? And he's like, yeah, you fucking hate the Wildcats. And I was like, mate, piss off. I said, seriously, (laughs) do you really think I care who won the game? I have no care. I don't care. I'm just calling the game, mate. I don't hate the Wildcats. You know, but it's amazing how fans can – and I sort of do it a little bit in footy, you know, myself, and I'm listening to commentators. You can hear – take one little thing that a commentator will say, go, oh, he hates our team. He hates yeah. our team. And you can you can hear there'd be 10 comments and there might be eight that are positive. And you say two that you think they need to change and they're not doing well enough. Mm-hmm. And fans and passionate fans jump onto those things and take the narrative that you actually hate their team. And then yeah. actually believe it. <laughs> it's, it blows <laughs> me away that, yeah. um, that that actually happens. But it does. And I, I think Perth, travelling around the country, Perth is by far the worst for that where they think that everybody's against them. when it's actual true. Fact, but a lot of people don't care. You yeah. know what? It's like I say to people, it's like, man, you guys build yourself up too much. You, you, the, the relevance of Perth isn't as big in my mind as you think it is in yours. We don't yep. care. <laughs> we don't. You're such a Victorian, honestly. Just, you don't care about us. Don't care about us over here. Um, with uh, with the new ownership coming in board, um, so Hachi and Sen taking that over, obviously after Jack Bendat was such a, a vital piece um, for the Wildcats and everything that you know their success. It it must be 
I don't know, what do you see from the outside, someone like that coming over, taking over from um, what they had, and now they've missed the playoffs twice in a row. Like they got in the play and that doesn't count. What do you do you ever look do you look at that and be like the sister changing and it will eventually even out or I don't know is there w- what's happening over there? Well, probably, but I, I mean, if there's two places you don't want to be an outsider coming in and either taking over an entire program, um, it, it, it's in Perth and it's in Adelaide. Yeah. Because I feel like if you don't succeed, then you're going to get turned on real quick, mm. real quick. More so than Victoria. Sydney is such a big place. No one really cares in Sydney. Like, if you're doing well, everyone jumps on board and everything else. But there's no fans in any of the sports that are that passionate like you see in Victoria and some of the other states. So he was always at a hiding to nothing. He knew that it was all about SEN and and the radio and the media that he was coming in for, and he made that purchase. Um, And then, you know, things haven't really worked out as far as you know, any sort of success and to the opposite where the worst results in the last 35 years, it's really unheard of that Perth could not make the playoffs two years in a row. Um, Big challenges for them now and for Mills because you pick the team, you know, you you run with it. And and for me, this is probably Danny Mills' last chance, I would have thought, if you failed so badly in the first two years. And I think that's probably why... They went so hard on Keanu Pinder. They had to, and yep. they probably overpaid because they had to. And it was a slap in the face to lose Luke Travis when you got a young kid that I think will play in the NBA at some stage, got a great talent to lose a young Western Australian kid that says, if I'm going to succeed, it's not going to be at my hometown. Then that's not, not yeah. a great thing. Yeah. But I expect them to bounce back. You know, they've got the money. They'll spend the money. Um, you know, when you've got Bryce Cotton who – you know, I've always advocated he's the best player in the league. Yep. I still thought he was the MVP this year. Um, he's just an incredible player and demands so much attention. I thought for Luke Travers, this was the place for him to learn and, and play off somebody as good as Bryce Cotton, but we'll see how that plays out for him. Do you think the, the Ty Webster thing comes into play there? Because I think he's probably second, you know, the, the the second guy that gets the ball in his hands. So if Travers is looking at that and going, I'm probably third, maybe fourth, like that maybe feels to him that he's just not in the right environment to get the ball in his hands as much as he needs. With it telling a team that he's not going to be third, fourth, fifth yeah. option. Yeah, yeah. That has a yeah. chance to win a championship. Where is it? Yeah, nowhere really. I think if, if if he's the second option on any team, they're not winning the championship. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. He needs to... Um, I, you know, yeah. And I think he needs to understand that that's okay too. Like when he goes to the NBA, the NBA teams need to know that he can play a valuable role and play around stars and complement those guys by rebounding, playing great D, being a facilitator, improving his three-point shot, being able to make plays off different guys. That's the easiest role. He hasn't shown that he's ready to be the second best player on any team in the competition that thinks they're making the playoffs. I think sometimes the grass is greener and, you know, it'll be interesting to see where he ends up and how that goes for him and whether that's the same as what he thinks he's ready for or whether he's really that fourth, fifth option like he was in Perth anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I guess there must be some sort of freedom to that where you have – you know, you just need to go out there and um, and play off others, and 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 because it reminds me of sort of like Nick Kay when he was at the Perth Wildcats. He, like Bryce Cotton and um, and the I can't remember who the other import at the, at the time was, just always had the ball in their hands. And Nick Kay just got to run amok. He was grabbing rebounds. He's you know getting points off putbacks, and um, to have that role must be yeah pretty freeing. So I'm not sure where Luke finds himself there, um, but you know. It'd be interesting to see, and I, I hope he does well. It's um, it's been really positive seeing Zave Cooks in the NBA, and obviously the back end of the season, like there's not as much care on on games, especially at the Wizards because they're not winning games. But you know, he's shown that he can actually contribute, which has been positive. W- what do you think about um, Zave Cooks at the Wizards? Oh, it's great for him. You know, another Aussie to get an opportunity to play in the NBA. I think it's fantastic for the league and. He's a great kid and, you know, comes from a great family. So it's nice for him to have success and, and see that there's this pathway, you know, from the NBL that's continued to grow. I mean, 
when I went to the NBA, Luke Longley was the only one that had ever played in the NBA. So it wasn't even something that you thought was an opportunity. Whereas now we've got guys like Luke Travers that are coming through that believe they're going to go to the NBA and probably will. So it's a real positive for our sport. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you went to the NBA after playing in the NBL for a bit, did you like, cause it's a completely different era. There's no, there was no like social media buzz where, you know, highlights were floating around and people could sort of get to know um, players. It, how did that work? Like how were you being scouted and, um, and, and what was that process like? Well, mostly through the Olympics, you know, you had to have a big Olympic campaign or World Cup campaign to show that you could play against players, you know, that are at a world class. Um, you know, I remember my agent in 96 before the Olympics was still video cassettes back then. So he's <laughs> taping off games and, you know, putting highlights together and full games and half games and quarters and then sending them to every NBA team in the hope that you're going to be able to, you know, get there. But, you know, it was more a dream back then than it was a reality. And, and you're right, the world's so small now. And, um, and because we've seen so many players come through the NBL, and because now the Americans realise that the rest of the world can play basketball, <laughs> they're looking for players outside, you know, of America. And they understand that Aussies are good teammates as well that can really fit a role. And you look at Daly back there at his age and play a minimal role, but realise that there's a real positive for having somebody like him on the squad. What was that phone call like when you found out the Timberwolves were going to sign you? Um, well, I had six offers after the Olympics. So right. it was more about working out which team had the biggest interest because all six offers were non-guaranteed um, training squad um, right. contracts. And it was working out which team that were most serious that I could get a guaranteed deal with. So it was really the Lakers, Atlanta and, and Minnesota and, and I went to um, straight from Atlanta, uh, from the Olympics, to Summer League with uh, Minnesota, um, had a five-day camp and then played in the Summer League games and then came out of that and signed a guaranteed deal. You got to play in one of the better Timberwolves jerseys. The um, it's funny when I when I see that jersey that like I just think of you wearing it as well. Like I, th I think of like Kevin Garnett and and you wearing that jersey. It's it's iconic. Um, I think they've started to bring it back a little bit, but it is like you got to play in one of the best ones. Yeah, yeah, and no, it was and it was cool. I mean, I played on that team that was the first team that ever made the playoffs which sort of hurt me a little bit because the team was so young and I was playing behind Stefan Marbury. And as it, the, we got through the season, it looked like we were going to make the playoffs. Then the, they sort of limited how much rotation on the bench was sort of coming in. So, yep. um, But it was an exciting time to be there and, you know, seeing Kevin Garnett at 19 and Stefan Marbury, Tom Gugliotta was probably my best mate on the team and he was an all-star and incredible basketball player. So, yeah, it was nice. I learned so much and, you know, grateful for the opportunity that I didn't ever think I'd get. Do you remember checking into that first game, what that feeling was like? I don't remember the first game. Um, I know I played a lot of games early on where um, – and because I was signed for three years, they brought in Terry Porter to back up Stefan Maru because he was still a teenager. So I became the third point guard, and it was the second year that they sort of promised me the backup role yeah. Um, so it was pretty frustrating in the first year. I played so many games where, you know, I'd come on for a minute or two minutes or whatever. And there were times where it was the third quarter and I thought it was the fourth quarter. I got so bored at different stages <laughs> in that first season. But, um, yeah, it was, it was eye-opening and, uh, like I said, I appreciated the chance. Yeah. At, at that point in, like, your career or, or anyone in a similar sort of boat when they're tr really just trying to break into a, a, a second spot or, or trying to make it um, into the starting team, are you – like, the cliche is that, you you know, you're playing for a t you're playing as a team and stuff like that, but when you're really trying to break in, do you have to be a bit selfish and, and show what you can do or do you just stick to the process and hope that it works out? No, I mean, you've got to play your role and you've just got to play it really well. Yeah. Um, so I knew exactly what that was. And every time I came into the game, sort of knew, you know, what I had to be able to do to help the team. But you're trying to play your role the best you can to help the team. And at the same time, you know, there's a lot of competition. I mean, the difference, you know, between some of these guys averaging five points a game versus 10 points a game could be 10 years in a year. So yeah. there's no doubt there's a self selfish element to the NBA. And, you know, it was a way different mindset 
you know, we grew up as a team and you eat together and you room with somebody and everything else. In the NBA, it's all just very, very individual and everyone's got, you know, the posse that come on the road and <laughs> hang out and it was only I had, a, you know, some, some good mates on the team. We spent a lot of time together, but it is a very individual league, you know, mm. most of the time. Is there NBA cities that you travel to and, and the guys would get pretty loose? Um, it's amazing because there's so many games and you're always traveling and, you know, I don't know how these guys get up for so many games, to be honest. Um, you sort of pick your times in the season about when you're going to go out and when you're going to have a good time. <laughs> There really wasn't a lot of drinking, you know, like in the NBL growing up, you know, you'd pick your times and you'd go on the road and everyone would go out and have a really big drink and, and, and have a lot of fun. But in the NBA, it's, it's a lot different than that. And there's certain times where you get a little bit more of a break in between games and you'd be on the road and that sort of happens, but certainly not as much. Yeah, I think there's, there was some like sort of interesting stat I was looking at around teams that are traveling from um from certain distance to miami and and how um poorly they perform um when they're when they're playing in miami and there's just like the miami knights um sort of curse that they've gone out the night before or something and and they can't really come um to 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 play in miami um what about um so you you played in the nba for a bit then you you um went to back to the nbl when you left the timberwolves did you think you would have a chance to go back was that like something in you that you thought would happen? No, well, I mean, I I had to ask five or six times to leave the Timberwolves because I was out for 16 weeks with a calf injury and it's probably one of the only regrets that I really had is that I wanted to come home. But when you got two kids under two and it's minus 30 degrees and, <laughs> you know, I was really down at that time because I'd worked so hard to be able to get myself right. I led the summer league. Uh, the um, Utah Summer League in assists, um, started the first five games of, of the exhibition season and, and then that's when I just totally obliterated my calf. So it's pretty down and, you, you know, regret that decision. Uh, but I ended up spending, you know, three years in, in Europe, um, had a great time in Europe, really fit into the European style of game. Uh, it certainly helped my game and, and ended up getting another chance to go back to the NBA at a later date. But... Um, yeah, probably probably one of the regrets that I do have. You got to, got to play under Coach Pop, who's uh, Popovich, who's considered you know one of the greatest coaches of all time. Um, must be a bit of an honour to be able to play under someone like that. Yeah, no doubt. You know, play alongside guys like Timmy Duncan and um, Ginobili and Parker and, and those things. And you know, I was at the end of my career. I was surprised to actually get an opportunity to go and try out at some at um sorry at veterans camp and to then actually make it and then stick and then i got cut and then they brought me back and then they said to me um you know we're going to make another move so we've got a hotel here for you seven to ten days and then we'll re-sign you but i picked up a game to go back to greece for more money than i was on in the nba and i was at the end of my career and i was like you know i don't really want to be 12th man i don't yeah. want to sit at the end of the bench and just clap and like, you know, I love to compete and, yeah. you know, went back yeah. to Greece and I was there two days later and playing again in, you know, one of the toughest leagues in the world. Yeah, those European crowds look crazy as well. Um, they're, they're all, like, packed in on each other. Do you have any um, any good moments that you can recall playing in, in that league? Oh, yeah, I mean, heaps, heaps. Um, you know, the, the crowds are so passionate and, um, you know, I, I loved to get the crowds going. And, uh, you know, nothing better than to hear the chants of those huge Greek crowds as you hit a three and they start singing and the drums and, and all the rest of it. So it's a different different mentality and I'm glad I got the chance to experience lots of, you yep. know, different leagues around the world and countries and things like that. And a kid growing up in Victoria where, you know, basketball wasn't very big, to think that I would have travelled and, and being able to experience all of those things is something I was very fortunate to have. You must have gone, well, I, I assume, I mean, maybe I shouldn't assume, but did you used to go at the opposing crowds? You know, if you'd hit a big shot, would you would you say stuff to them? See, I did that everywhere in the world, but not as much in Greece because it was actually dangerous, the, right. the amount of times right. that riots would start. I mean, the crowd is separated, the fans are separated by riot police that have guns and batons and shields and fences and things like that. So it is very easy to incite some very difficult 
um, time. So they spoke to me very, very um, clearly not to say anything, not to react to players <laughs> and everything when you go on the road. So it's a little bit hard for me, but uh, I had to learn. Oh, man, if you were the reason why a riot started, you'd feel pretty bad. So it must have been relatively easy to hold your tongue. Um, can we let's just talk quickly before we um, wrap up? You went and finished your career um, playing in the NBL and then you retired and then you came out of retirement, um, which like I'm not an athlete, but it must be something that athletes think like that would be a cool thing to do, like retire and then announce to everyone you're coming back. What was that process like? Um. Yeah, I'd always thought once I retired, the last game I was going to play was captaining the Sydney Kings Championship, first ever championship, and and I retired then, and then got the opportunity to go back, go to San Antonio, and then Greece, and play in another Olympics for Gorgian, and then I retired and said, yeah, now I'm done, shifted to the Gold Coast, and was loving life in retirement, and and then um, then Mark Cowan from the new team um, came and offered me a contract, said, will you come back? And I sort of was a little bit intrigued. And then once it got out, I heard people saying, oh, there's no way you could come out of retirement at 36 and actually, you know, compete and play. And that was probably the thing. I said, oh, really? That's – I can't, huh? And then <laughs> I ended up doing it. So I'd been drinking beers for – I didn't drink beer until I was 34 and retired and shipped <laughs> to the Gold Coast. And it was, uh, I got the taste of it and then came out of retirement two years later. Wow. There you go. And so then in that season, the coach at the time, um, it wasn't, it didn't, wasn't very long and the coach resigned or fired up. Uh, you know, no, he got sacked. Yeah. He got sacked. <laughs> and you, and you became the coach, the player coach, which is, which seems like a lost art in today's sport. Like I can't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know of many players that are doing that anymore. Um, no. what was, what was that like? And, and how did that even come about? Did you just put your hand up or did they come to you and ask? Yeah. No, they came to me. I think the team was zero and six, and you know it was pretty apparent to everybody involved at the entire club that Mark Price, as nice a guy he was, certainly wasn't cut out to coach and, right. and probably didn't have the passion to do the work that it took. So um, they came to me and said, "Will you do it? If you're not going to do it, then we're going to find somebody else." He's done. And then I said, "Who are you looking at?" They told me some of the names, and I was like. I didn't come out of retirement to play for them. So I ended up coaching and we turned things around and, um, you know, went from zero and six to make the playoffs, which was an incredible um, run and and fun. And and then the second year we went even younger again on a small budget and that certainly wasn't as much fun. And (laughs) I had surgery during the year and, and all the rest of it. So it didn't end up a great experience. And there's certain reasons why people aren't playing and coaching. That's because it's difficult and yeah. it doesn't work, and we won't ever see it again. <laughs> <laughs> so were you calling subs and stuff while you were on the call? Like, who was who was organising rotations? Yeah, so, no, I'd had an assistant coach that, that called subs, and we yeah. sort of went through that before the game about where we're at. And, you know, you're going to make adjustments as it's going on. But, you know, it was probably the, the, probably the best thing about being a player coach is that when I came off, I could just walk straight up to the bench and then walk back on again without having to wait for a sub but um yeah no it was it was it was fun it was tough experience and then it was really really tough in the second second year yeah um and now you're obviously you've you've, the most recent things you've been doing is is coaching you coach in the uh, the WNBL um is is that something that you want to continue to keep doing and and um like still being involved in basketball yeah well I've never stopped being involved in basketball so I've got an academy here in Sydney um, called Elite Basketball Development that I've had for six years now. So um, I love coaching the young kids and teaching them the skills and techniques and what it takes to be able to make the next level. So, you know, I'll I'll continue to coach. I've got the basketball show that we just finished our fifth fifth year that's been, you know, when when I first proposed that to people, they said, oh, no, no, there's no appetite for a basketball show. And (laughs) now we've just finished our fifth year and, you know, we're getting about 200,000 views a week um, through KO and, and News Corp. So, you know, really passionate about that and having a voice and having some fun and giving honest feedback about, you know, what I think. And, you know, Derek Rucker and Joe Healy on that show as well. So, you know, I'll always be involved in basketball just because it's where my passion is. And, yep. you know, I work my daughter out daily and, you know, hope that she continues to, to, to grow and get opportunities like I had. 
Yeah, for sure. We um <clears throat> we spoke probably uh, it would have been four or five years ago when I was working at the Perth Links. Um, I was the the media manager there, and uh, that was when Shyloth got her first crack at the. Uh, the WNBL. Um, that must have been a pretty proud moment to see a daughter suiting up and um, playing professionally. Oh, I mean, yes and no. I mean, she, you know, she just played at the World Cup and made the All Star Five in the world. So it's sort of when you're going over there and you're seeing her compete on the world stage, she was always going to play in the WNBL. She did when she was 14, and um, so it was a disappointing year in 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 Perth because she got a stress fracture, yeah. you know, the week before the season started and virtually missed the whole season. So yeah. you know, it was nice for her to sort of, you know, get a taste of it again. You know, had some talented players on that team, uh, but just disappointing with the injury. And um, but you know, I think now, you know, she's got to the stage now. She's going to go overseas. She won't be playing in the WNBL next season. And um, looking forward to her understanding of European basketball and continuing to take another step forward and, you know, hopefully playing for the Opals next year. Yeah, I recall um, just watching her in a cast, um, just sort of hobbling up and down the court, just doing dribbling drills by herself because, you know, she was obviously just desperate to get out there and just would just spend hours just dribbling and, and working on her handles just all in a, in a cast. It was <laughs> funny to watch. Well, I think she was only 16 or something yeah. like that at the time. Um, but, yeah, it was more disappointing because she was ready to play. Yeah. She was really ready to be able to contribute. And I know Andy Stewart had high hopes for what she was going to be able to deliver for them. So, um, you know, it's just as a pro athlete, you learn to, you know, understand there's going to be ups and downs, and that was certainly one of the downs. And, you know, she's had other downs through her career already for someone 21. Yep. She played 100 yep. games in the WNBL but had some real highs and some lows and some things she's had to navigate through that, will continue to make it stronger for the rest of their career. Yeah, for sure. We'll finish up. I've got a couple of questions that people have sent in. Um, first one uh, first one is this. Who's the best player you've played with and why is it Andrew Gaze? <laughs> well, I mean, Drewy was unbelievable to play with. And, um, you know, I played three of my four Olympics with him and he's a legend of our, our sport. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, there's no one more passionate and hardworking than Drewy and, and where's his heart and his sleeve. So, yeah, Drewy from an Australian standpoint, but, you know, I, I was very fortunate to play with some of the names that I've said, yep. you know, with Kevin Garnett and, and Tim Duncan, um, some of these guys that are absolute sort of legends of the world game as well. Yeah. One of the things I um, – <clears throat> the, the funny things I love about Andrew Gaze is the um, how the NBL brought in an award called the NBL Most Efficient Player Award. And he won it from its, you know, first year and he won it eight years in a row. So they just stopped giving it out because he just kept winning it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he, his numbers were Bradman-like. It was, it was yeah. I mean, it was incredible when you can average 40-something points in a game and the whole game plan is to be able to shut him down. And, you know, I played on Drewy every time we played against them and, you know, it was always a, a really successful night for me if you could hold him in the 20s just because of, you know, <laughs> what he was capable of being able to do and the whole offense has run around him and, and all the rest of it, but he was a freak. Yeah. Um, one more question. Uh, what is the Olympic Village like? You've got to experience a few of those. Was it – I've just heard stories, but, you know, it's all rumor and speculation. Well, the Olympic Village was different. Every – all four of my Olympics was very different, but um, – you know, you probably hear stories more from the swimmers that compete for the first week and then as yep. basketballers that, you know, we, we play on the first day and you go all the way to the last day. So you're totally focused on what you're doing and getting ready and, and recovering and all the rest of it. And then you see you just start hearing all the athletes start partying as the, uh, <laughs> as the two weeks goes on and people, you know, drop out or have success and they just enjoy it. So yep. um, we certainly had a couple of days at the end of each Olympics where we had a chance to be able to enjoy ourselves and, and get amongst it. One more, for, one more from me before I let you go. Um, obviously, you you you're a big part of Australian basketball and on the Olympic stage. What was it like for you seeing the Aussies finally get a medal? It was emotional. It was emotional. Um, yeah, I was just so proud of the guys and you know having a big affiliation with Gorge and guys like Joe Ingalls to be able to get it done and. You know, so many people had come before them and got close and we'd finished fourth twice 
um, and felt like we were right there to be able to do it and for these guys to be able to persist and 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 for those NBA guys to you know really sacrifice so much every year to be, stay part of it and bring young guys in it was uh, yeah it was it was really emotional I was working for sunrise during those two weeks and staying up every night and I ended up staying up having some drinks celebrating on my own because <laughs> the family had gone to bed and even though I had to be up at five the next morning I was certainly a bit croaky the next morning and, and uh and went in a proud ex-boomer yeah so good well um shane thanks for chatting to us and catching us up on uh you know nba nbl stuff as well um backchat underscore basketball on instagram is where you can find us so you can send us an email hello at backchatpodcast.com.au we'll check in with you again in the in the in the future shane um and uh yeah good luck to uh your uh the bucks hopefully they they get some victories and and please just you know pour one out for my uh, dallas mavericks and maybe we can do something next season maybe we should throw a big prayer out and hope that your wildcats can get back to the playoffs <laughs> very good thanks shane <laughs> good on you mate